Today's episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Growing up in the 80s, most of my favorite TV shows were the ones my older brothers watched. Magnum P.I., The A-Team, The Greatest American Hero, and Quantum Leap. But it wasn't until I got much older and I started collecting records that I realized one man wrote all of these theme songs. And the more I looked into his life, the more I was blown away by how much he accomplished. I mean, this guy produced five top 10 singles, he won five Grammy Awards plus an Emmy, which only begs the question why he isn't more well known as compared compared to many film composers. Well, on today's program, I aim to change that as we look into the life of producer, composer, and arranger, Mike Post. Mike Post was born as Leland Michael Postel in Berkeley, California on September 24th, 1944. He spent the first six years living in the greater San Francisco Bay Area before his family settled in the Southern California city of Burbank. Even before he could talk, he had the gift of music and was able to reproduce the lullaby his mother would sing on his toy xylophone. His parents enrolled him in piano lessons at the age of six, and while he enjoyed learning music, it wasn't until he was 14 that he caught the bug. He happened to watch a band performing in a club, and when he witnessed the audience's reaction, especially from the ladies, he wanted to be a part of the scene, and a week later, he was in a band. He attended Grant High School in North Hollywood with his close friend and future TV star, Tom Selleck. Post spent his days playing sports and his nights performing at Hollywood clubs as a guitarist. In fact, he even played the night of his high school graduation. Because of his talents, he was in many different acts and he would often play in touring bands of popular vocal recording artists. He even got to open for the Rolling Stones in 1964 as part of the backing band for Dick and Dee Dee. His first big break came with Sonny and Cher in 1965. While working in the studio, they were having trouble getting the right sound out of a harpsichord. And so so Wrecking Crew member Mike Rubini recommended they bring in Post to play his electric 12-string guitar. At this time, Post was one of maybe two guitarists in the LA area that played it in a finger-picking style, which Rubini thought would be just the unique sound they were looking for. And so Post came down to Gold Star Recording Studios in Hollywood, and one of the songs he recorded that day was the hit single, I Got You Babe. This experience was profound. He loved the studio environment because it didn't matter how you dressed and you could have as many takes as you needed to get the part right. From that point on, Post moved to doing session work almost exclusively, leaving live gigs behind. He quickly became part of the B team for the Wrecking Crew. However, he didn't really last long as he had aspirations of actually leading the band rather than taking direction as a session player. He also wasn't as versatile as the other guitarists in the Wrecking Crew as he really only had one way of playing. And while that style was really popular at the time, he knew that it could easily fade in demand. Post understood that his real strengths were in producing and arranging, and so he took to producing as many local acts and garage bands as he could find using his own money. His hard work paid off as it caught the eye of Frank Sinatra's producer, Jimmy Bowen. He took Post under his wing and started giving him work under the Warner Brothers slash Reprise label, but with the stipulation that Post produced a hit single within 18 months. It only took Post nine months to come back with the first edition's debut album, a band he put together featuring future country star Kenny Rogers. The record produced a huge hit single, Just Dropped In, and he would go on to produce their next three albums. In 1968, Post was tasked with producing and arranging Mason Williams' next album. Together, they made the number two hit single, Classical Gas, which earned Post his first Grammy Award for arranging at the age of 23. Also in 68, at a Jimmy Bowen golf tournament, Post met his future musical partner, Pete Carpenter. Despite their age difference of maybe 30 years, they got along instantly and collaborated on Post's 1969 debut album, Fused. That same year, Post landed the musical director gig for The Andy Williams Show, a move that at 24 made him the youngest person to hold that position in US TV history. In his tenure, he pioneered the idea of pre-recording the music that would later be played back for the guests to sing to live on the show. 
Prior to his arrival, they would often record the music pieces live with the singers, which was not ideal. Not only was it hard to mix upwards of 30 musicians, but then there was the introduction of lag between the band and the singer that would often wreak havoc on the timing. Plus, most of the musicians were session players that did their best work in the studio and loathed playing live TV. By pre-recording the music tracks in the studio, this sped up production time, kept everybody happy, and made sure the show came on budget. He stayed on the program for two years and brushed shoulders with some of the top artists of the day, including Aretha Franklin, Smokey Robinson, and even his idol Ray Charles. His job performance proved he wasn't just some young, stuck-up kid. He was responsible, respectful of the stars, and his arranging work helped to keep Andy Williams relevant well into the early 70s. Sometime during or after his stint on The Andy Williams Show, Post had a chance encounter with TV writer and producer Stephen J. Cannell. They immediately hit it off and became fast friends. And when Cannell produced his first show in 1973, the short-lived Toma, Post was the first guy he called to score the theme song. Their working relationship proved to be lifelong as Post would go on to score many of Cannell's projects, including the 1974 hit series, The Rockford Files. The Post and Carpenter Pen theme was released as a single, climbing the charts to become a top 10 hit and earning Post another two Grammy Awards. Post and Carpenter continued working on shows and TV movies throughout the rest of the 70s, but it was the 80s that proved to be their most successful decade by far. Starting in 1980, Post produced Dolly Parton's number one selling album, 9 to 5 and Odd Jobs. Also in 1980, Carpenter and Post scored a replacement theme for the show, Magnum P.I. The original theme song by Ian Freeburn Smith was used for the first nine episodes, but its jazz-inspired opening didn't quite mesh with the visuals. For Mike, this was probably his easiest gig yet as he was still close friends with Tom Selleck and he knew exactly what to write. The new theme song proved to be very memorable, reaching number 25 on the pop charts. 1981 kicked off with two big hits. January saw the premiere of his theme to Hill Street Blues, which went on to earn Post another two Grammy Awards. Then in March, he had his biggest chart success with the theme to The Greatest American Hero, which reached the number two spot. Then in 1983, he scored the A-Team, and then in 86, he wrote the theme to L.A. Law, earning him his fifth Grammy Award. And keep in mind, in addition to scoring the theme songs for all these TV shows and more, Carpenter and Post also wrote a lot, if not all, of the incidental music heard throughout the episodes. Sadly though, in 1987, Pete Carpenter passed away. In celebration of his life and their 18 years together, Post, along with the BMI Foundation, created the Pete Carpenter Fellowship in 1989. Also in 1989, Post created the scores for Quantum Leap and Doogie Howser, MD. And then in 1990, Post got to work with his longtime friend, Dr. John, on the theme song for Blossom. But 1990 also saw his music being used on one of the worst TV shows ever created, the notorious musical cop show called Cop Rock. The program was put out of its misery after 11 episodes, but Post did get to work with Randy Newman for the theme, which was a win in his book. Despite Cop Rock bombing, it was his work on 1990's Law & Order that would become his most memorable. Besides writing its classic theme song, he also created the iconic cha-chong sound. The story goes, show creator Dick Wolf asked Post to create a sound for the title cards. Mike initially turned him down, telling him to ask the sound effect guys, but Wolf was persistent and convinced Post to come up with something. Mike sampled a jail door slamming among other sounds, and what he came up with is actually notated. It's a piece of music and not a sound effect. In fact, to this day, Post still gets royalties every time it's used, which is why he affectionately calls it the cha -ching sound. In 1992, he wrote the theme song for Silk Stockings, and a year later, he created the memorable title song for NYPD Blue, which was inspired by subway trains and Phil Collins' famous drum fill from In the Air Tonight. To create the percussive opening, he sampled many different instruments as well as non-instruments including a cheese grater and anywhere from 500 to 1,000 men stomping on a hardwood floor. 
Then in 1996, he won his first Emmy Award for his theme to Murder One, and a year later he would produce what would essentially be regarded as an Eddie Van Halen solo album. As the 90s wore into the 2000s, a number of different shows he worked on slowed as he was busy scoring incidental music for the mini spin-offs of Law & Order. In fact, he's still composing music for Law & Order SVU, which as of 2019 is the longest running primetime live action show in TV history. In a business where egos can run rampant, it's refreshing to know that Mike Post never let his success get to his head. He remains to this day humble and appreciative of all that he has and what life has given him. He never lost sight of how lucky he got and he knows that his career was made of chance encounters and just being in the right place at the right time. Of course, it didn't hurt that some of his best friends just so happened to be very successful TV producers, but you know what? They wouldn't have kept working with him if he wasn't incredibly talented and hardworking. Mike understands that he's only as good as those around him and he never misses an opportunity to share the credit. I mean, just look at the back of his debut album. In an age where session musicians were largely forgotten in the liner notes, here he lists every person that worked on this record. In the end, he never worked for the money. Although the money was pretty nice, he worked because he loves to write music. And I think that comes through in each and every note of his many compositions. The reason we do it is because we have to. The reason we do it is because we're obsessive and obsessed with this. And it's a great thing to do for a living. It's a wonderful thing. And I would do it at any price. I would do it for free and I would work in a gas station to support it if I had to. It's really a cool thing to do. Hey everybody, if you like documentaries like this one, I think you're really gonna enjoy Curiosity Stream. It's a streaming subscription service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and nonfiction titles spanning art, history, science, and more. I really enjoyed one on the life of Frank Sinatra, but man, there's a whole series of films featuring David Attenborough that are so addicting. I just find his voice very relaxing. So if you wanna check it out for yourself right now, you can get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month, and the first 30 days are completely free. Just go to curiositystream.com slash Rewind and use the promo code Vana Rewind during checkout to get that special deal. All right, everybody, that will do it for today. Be sure to leave me a comment let me know your favorite TV theme song. Until then, I want to thank you all so much for watching, but I especially want to thank Mike Post for making all this great music and really shaping my childhood. Until then, I'm your Vinyl Geek, and I'll catch you on the flip side. Hey everybody, thanks again for watching. I put a couple of videos here that YouTube will choose for me. If you like what you see, I put out new videos every Tuesday and sometimes Fridays.